Good morning, everyone. For folks who do not know me, my name is Chloe Douglas. Um, I am one of the senior pediatric nephrology fellows at Seattle Children's Hospital, and I'm over overall here to present a project that's under review for publication detailing the association between neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation and pediatric kidney transplant outcomes in U.S. children. So as many of you all are aware on this call, um, addressing health disparities is very integral to kidney transplant management. Thus far, most of the scholarship has focused on indirect proxies for health disparities, such as race, insurance status, or individual socioeconomic status. However, I would argue that this approach is insufficient as it does not account for the impact of one's lived individual environment. And overall, it's been shown that neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation contributes to individual stress and health outcomes. However, longitudinal data describing this association in the U.S., and in particular in U.S. pediatric kidney transplant populations, is overall very lacking. And so, as I mentioned, a lot of the data is pretty sparse on um, pediatrics in the U.S., and so I wanted to highlight actually the largest um, pediatric study that was completed in a cohort of French children um, using a neighborhood deprivation index called the European Deprivation Index. Um, as you can see here on the left side, um, at any time after transplantation, patients living in the most deprived neighborhood, which would be quintile five in the study, had a twofold higher hazard risk of graft failure compared to patients from the least deprived area. And then on the right, you can see that the five and 10 year graft survival curves were 85% um, and 69% respectively in the most deprived group, which is quintile five or that um, more um, magenta line. Um, versus 90% and 83% respectively in the least deprived group, which is the black line there. And then in this same French cohort, looking at overall the initiation of dialysis versus preemptive transplantation, um, again, with the highest quintile being the neighborhoods with the highest level of socioeconomic deprivation, those living in those neighborhoods had a greater odds of kidney replacement therapy initiation with dialysis and overall um, significantly lower odds of preemptive registration for transplant. And then moving to the U.S., um, the largest study in the U.S. is actually completed in children is completed in um, pediatric liver transplant recipients. And this is a lovely study by Sharad Wadwani and overall um, splitting the population um, below and above the median level of neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. And overall, their group demonstrated that among U.S. pediatric liver transplant recipients, children from high deprivation neighborhoods were found to have diminished graft survival, which is the solid line here on the left. Um, and overall um, have um, poor um, patient survival compared to children um, from lower levels of neighborhood deprivation. All right, advanced. Okay, so to better understand the pathways by which neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation leads to poor health outcomes, we overall um, wanted to work on a conceptual model as we set out on this work that I'm going to share with you all. And overall, this model is rooted in what is known in um, current epidemiology and public population health literature, along with rooted in patients' um, lived experiences. So in this model, you can see that there is a neighborhood level and then an individual or family unit level. In addition, you can see that there's this life course um, on the right side and overall demonstrating that the processes by which we're going to discuss occur throughout the life course from birth to end stage to transplant and across genera generations. I'm first gonna zoom in on the um, neighborhood level. And so due to isms such as racism, sexism, xenophobia, and gender binarism, along with other isms, differences in socioeconomic and societal positions overall exist, which results in inequities in research, resource allocation and distribution. And overall, this difference in re resource allocation um, results in differences in neighborhood physical and social environments. The physical environments here overall include things like housing quality, environmental exposures, while neighborhood um, social environments overall include things such as neighborhood wealth, safety, and social capital. And these components then overall dictate a neighborhood's level of socioeconomic deprivation, which we use as our exposure in our study. And focusing on the indi individual or family unit level, we conceptualize that neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation then um, does dictate individual family um, characteristics, such as access to psychosocial resources, material resources, and education and occupation um, levels. 
This then results in differences in health behavior, such as medication compliance and engagement with the healthcare team, in addition to the one's ability to advocate for oneself in the healthcare system that is quite complicated in the US. And that these behaviors then dictate access to transplant and subsequent kidney allograft survival if transplanted. So based on this prior research, we overall aim to describe the association between neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation and access to living donor and preemptive transplant and grass survival in U.S. pediatric kidney transplant recipients. And our second aim was to identify areas for intervention at the transplant center and national levels to promote equitable transplant outcomes for marginalized children in the U.S. The whole goal of this work is not to describe, but to act and intervene to help our patients and families. So then overall, um, our hypotheses were that U.S. pediatric kidney transplant recipients exposed to neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation will have lower 10-year allograft survival, lower odds of living donor transplant, and lower odds of preemptive transplant. And then getting into our methods, our data source was the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, or SRTR. SRTR, as many of you all know, collects data submitted to the registry by the members of the OPTN. It includes data on all donors, recipients, and waitlisted candidates in the U.S., and overall is overseen by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or HRSA. Our study population um, included those who were less than equal to 18 years of age at time of registration or listing for transplant. And overall received a kidney transplant from January 1, 2010 to May 31, 2022. We did exclude um, multi-organ um, and prior kidney transplant recipients from our study. Recipients were then stratified into three groups according to neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation, which we um, determined using the Material Community Deprivation Index or the MCDI, which I will explain in detail in the next, in the next slide. And those living in neighborhoods of the lowest level of neighborhood deprivation overall served as the reference population for our study. And then we utilize Cox, and Propor Cox proportional hazard and logistic regression modeling to estimate our outcomes of interest. So there's a lot of deprivation ind indices out there. I'm sure many of you have come across them. Um, and so the index we use is the MCDI. Um, and overall, it's a neighborhood deprivation index that's based on data from the American Community Survey, which is a census-based survey um, serving households in the US, um, which a lot of the other indices are based on. And overall, it's assigned to the individual at the zip code tabulation level. It's kind of a fancy just area uh, measure that is derived from five digit zip codes. Um, and that is the most granular measure of neighborhood that is available in SRTR at this time. And we use zip codes at time of listing in our study. Um, again, this index is publicly available information and the figure on the right um, overall shows the distri distribution of MCDI scores across the US. Um, and as you can see here, there are six components to the MCDI um, and includes components such as neighborhood poverty level, housing, and education characteristics. So then moving on to our results, during the study period, 9,908 recipients less than, than, less than or equal to 18 years of age at time of listening underwent a kidney transplant in the U.S. And after applying our exclusion criteria, you can see that we included 9,719 recipients in our analyses. Now for table one, that um, it's quite busy, so I'll zoom in on it. Um, like I said, overall, we had 9,719 recipients in our study. And we um, divided our study population into three groups representing areas of low, intermediate, and high neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation by MCDI. And overall, the median MCDI scores ranged from 0.26 to 0.63. Um, overall, patients identifying as Black were overrepresented in neighborhoods of highest socioeconomic deprivation, ranging from just 11% of recipients in neighborhoods of lowest level of deprivation to 24% of recipients in neighborhoods with the highest level of deprivation. In addition, the proportion of recipients identifying as Hispanic also increased as neighborhood deprivation increased, ranging from just 17% of recipients living in neighborhoods of low socioeconomic deprivation up to 67% of recipients living in neighborhoods of the highest level of deprivation. And as you may expect, as neighborhood deprivation increased, the proportion of recipients with public insurance also increased. Now, zooming in the latter half of our table one, 
as you can see, as neighborhood deprivation increased, dialysis duration increased, with 55% of recipients in areas of high socioeconomic deprivation being on dialysis for greater than equal to one year versus 34% in the areas of low neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. Overall, the median waitlist time was somewhat similar across the population, ranging from 0.5 point a uh, half of year to 0.6 years um, and, er, and amongst recipients in neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation. So fairly similar. In addition, as neighborhood deprivation increased, um, the proportion of preemptive transplant decreased. So you can see it goes from 35% to 20% of those living in areas of high socioeconomic deprivation, while the proportion of deceased donor transplants increased as neighborhood deprivation increased, with 87% of individuals in the areas of the highest level of socioeconomic deprivation receiving a deceased donor transplant. And then moving on to our statistical models, after adjusting for recipient age, and this is talking about living donor transplantation, so we adjusted for recipient age, dialysis duration, diagnoses, which I'm going to refer to as our base model for the um, living donor models. Recipients in neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation overall had a 79% lower odds of living donor transplant compared to the reference population, which was the low, um, the, uh, low level of neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. And you can see recipients living in neighborhoods of any intermediate socioeconomic deprivation had a 48% lower odds of living donor transplant compared to the reference group after adjusting for these base covariates. Then we added race and ethnicity to the base model and overall recipients in neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation had a 65% lower odds of living donor transplant or an adjusted odds rate of ratio of 0.35. And then adding insurance status to the base model, so not to the race and ethnicity plus base model, but just to the base model. Overall, you can see that we found that a 70% lower odds of living donor transplant amongst recipients in neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation. Now, moving on to the models for preemptive transplantation, you can see that recipients in neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation had a 51% lower odds of preemptive transplant after adjusting for age at listing and diagnosis, which is our base model here. And then recipients living in neighborhoods of intermediate socioeconomic deprivation had a 37% lower odds of preemptive transplant um, after adjusting for the base covariates here. And then again, adding race and ethnicity to this base model, intermediate, intermediate and high socioeconomic deprivation were associated with 28% and 30% lower odds of preemptive transplant respectively compared to the reference population. And then when insurance status was added to the base model, intermediate, intermediate and high socioeconomic deprivation were associated with 19% and 28% lower odds of preemptive transplant. Now with regards to graph survival, we studied 10-year death censored graph loss. Here is the survival curve representing graph loss for each group. Um, the solid line overall represents those living in neighborhoods of low, so low socioeconomics, um, or low neighborhood deprivation. And then you can see this fine dotted line here are those living in areas of high um, neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. Overall, 1,716 recipients experienced graph loss in the follow-up period, with the median time to graph loss being 12.3 years. Overall, the rates of 10-year graph loss amongst those of um, high neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation was 42% versus 27% in those in areas of low neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. And what we found interesting here is by year one, you can really notice separation between um, those living in neighborhoods of um, low neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation and then the intermediate and high um, socioeconomic deprivation and then further splaying out of these survival lines, overall demonstrating that a lot of this um, differences in outcomes is occurring very early on in the transplant um, experience. Advanced, sorry, one second. There we go. So then looking at hazard models for death censored graph loss, um, when adjusted for base covariates of recipient age, dial duration, donor type, cold ischemia time, and recipient diagnoses, those in areas of high socioeconomic deprivation had a 51% greater risk of graph loss compared to the reference group, while those living in neighborhoods of intermediate socioeconomic deprivation had a 45% greater risk of graph loss. These estimates overall did not really change when, added, uh, when adding race and ethnicity or insurance status to the models. And overall, this would, su 
would suggest that it is more than these two commonly used proxies in our health disparities research, um, and rather the social and physical environments created as a result of inequities and structural racism that patients live in that are playing a major role in disparities in the transplant, in transplant access and outcomes. So to summarize our findings, um, pediatric kidney transplant recipients exposed to neighborhoods of high socioeconomic deprivation had a greater risk of graft loss and lower odds of living donor and preemptive transplant. Um, we overall argue that these inequities in graft loss and access to uh, living donor and preemptive transplant related to um, neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation do exist. An overall future investigation should include a focused evaluation of barriers from the perspective of kidney transplant recipients and caregivers. I do think there's a, a lot of need in this space for qualitative research of really understanding the experience, especially those who are living in areas of high neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation that are able to overcome those barriers and what is unique about their experience or resources compared to others. And overall, um, further steps are needed to identify and remove these barriers to improve patient um, um, outcomes. There are, are some limitations of our study that I will highlight. One of them I kind of alluded to before was that SRTR clicks um, only five-digit zip codes currently. You can submit a nine-digit zip code, but it's not mandatory. Um, and so therefore, it's majority of nine-digit zip codes. And overall, zip codes, as many of you know, were created to optimize mail delivery. Um, and overall, uh, they do offer benefits because they're readily available and very convenient but there's a wide heterogeneity of neighborhoods that exist, with, exist within the same zip code and the same zip code tabulation area. Um, and overall, that is a weakness of using um, zip five-digit zip codes in this score. And overall, more granular measures of neighborhood, such as census block groups, um, and which are used with other indices, such as the area deprivation index that others might be more familiar with, or overall preferred, but that is just not available in our national data set at this time. In addition, um, we were unable to include household level social determinant health data um, as this is not included in SRTR. Um, so it's possible an individual um, who has a certain socioeconomic status um, that um, was discrepant overall from their assigned level of neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation. Um, and overall their experience may be very different from others who are living in that same area. However, um, I think it's interesting to think about the effects of living near um, these areas of high neighborhood socioeconomic deprivation um, beyond these individual factors, um, but that cannot really be assessed in this study. Um, the, last, um, uh, the last limitation is that we assume that the recipient zip code remained constant from time of listing onward, because um, that is what is available in SRTR, um, and um, thus their level of neighborhood socioeconomic de deprivation overall remained constant. However, I would argue that despite these limitations, this MCDI or other area deprivation indices do offer the advantage of being a comprehensive, readily available index for patients with zip code data that can be used in both the research and clinical settings. So moving on to how do we think about improving um, or acting upon these disparate outcomes? Overall, I like to think about these two questions as we kind of travel on this path um, to um, health equity. Um, I'll propose these questions for you all is, um, how can neighborhood measures be used to identify children and families in the greatest need is at onset of kidney disease? And what targeted interventions can we utilize to empower marginalized children and families undergoing kidney transplant in the US? Um, I wanted to go through some, um, a couple interventions and by no means this is an exhaustive list. There's a lot to do and a lot of work and help needed. Um, and kind of wanted to think about different levels of intervention. One level is the transplant center level. And overall, we greatly support initiatives to expand um, resources for addressing health disparities. This does include funding of social work, transportation and food vouchers, um, food pantries, et cetera, which many of these resources have been cut in response to um, lost profits during the pandemic. Um, and rather we need to be increasing these resources and support um, for our patients and families. Um, also, um, it would include exploration of the use of health advocates and navigating the pre-transplant and transplant experience. Um, I wanted to highlight a really interesting clinical trial underway um, led by Sharad Wadwani um, in the pediatric liver transplant population 
whose overall studying the impact of health advocates on, on graft and patient survival and pediatric liver transplant recipients. Um, and I think this, there's a lot of room to expand on doing this um, in the pre-transplant uh, experience for pediatric kidney transplant patients. And then um, moving on to the state governmental level, um, a lot of these, these factors are community-based um, and systemic level factors. And really we need to act as advocates at the governmental level. Um, to help uh, improve um, built environment um, for our patients and families. I highlighted some of the um, pediatric initiatives um, supported by the Washington chapter of the AAP this year that I do think um, contribute to um, patient um, access to transplant patient um, grass survival. Um, one of them is the Washington 2024 Washington Free Meals for All program, which is overall a proposed program that would provide um, all state elementary school students access to free breakfast and lunch. As many in need do not actually qualify for free and reduced lunch programs, and overall there is also a stigma attached with um, requiring these, and if everyone um, received free and reduced lunch, then there would be no stigma. So for example, a family of four with a household income of $56,000 a year would not qualify for free or reduced um, price meals in Washington state at this time. And they could expend a, um, upwards of $260 per month to participate in school meals. Another um, thing that is um, that they're advocating for is expansion of the Washington Community Health Worker Grant. So this was approved from January, 2023 to 2025 and they're advocating for extension and expansion of this program. Um, this is in the primary care setting and it's 30 funded clinics, including seven tribal clinics. And it's overall using these community health workers to um, um, complete social needs screenings and mental health screenings for both um, patient and um, caregivers, and then helping um, assist with navigation of resources when needs are identified. And then um, this is another bill um, that was actually recently passed in the Washington House, um, which is um, co-living for Washington State. This is more looking at um, housing and how do we um, create more affordable housing in our communities. So overall, um, this would uh, legalize co-living, which is defined as residences with um, independently rented living or sleeping areas with a shared kitchen or bathroom facilities. Um, and allowing those residences to exist wherever anything is zoned as multifamily housing and overall increasing affordable housing options in Washington state. And then moving on to the national um, theme, which many of you are familiar with some of these proposed bills that I will just hi highlight. Um, I really focused on living donation as um, this is associated with better outcomes and overall there's a extreme disparity for those who are um, overall marginalized in our, um, in our country of access to living donor transplant. So overall, um, uh, the Living Donor Protection Act um, of 2023, which is under review currently, could specifically benefit those neighbor those living in these areas of high socioeconomic deprivation. It would allow, um, it would essentially um, simplify uh, or prevent insurance um, discrimination um, for living donors so that carriers cannot deny, cancel, or impose conditions on policies for life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance um, based on an individual status as a living organ donor. And also, I think this is a huge part of the bill that is specifically could benefit um, these folks would be um, recovery from organ donation surgery would constitute as a serious health condition that entitles eligible employees to job protected medical leave, which is not the case currently. Um, a couple others that I wanted to highlight was the Honor Our Living Donors Act. Um, so overall, um, the it's going, it overall simplifies the access to financial support that's provided by the National Living Donor Assistance Center. Um, because currently requ these requirements to get this um, financial assistance as a low income organ donor, um, it's determined by the organ recipient's income, even though the organ recipient receives no support through the program and does not incur any donation related costs. And rather this bill is proposing that it's based on the donor's um, income, which I think makes a lot of sense. And then um, the last one I wanted to highlight was the Living Organ Donor um, Tax Credit Act of 2023. And so for those who are not getting um, this financial support through the National Living Donor Assistance Center would be eligible to a donor tax credit um, of $5,000 one time um, to be a living donor, which I think has a huge impact. So then wrapping up, I hope 
um, this work overall inspires, inspires you all to move beyond what we call midstream or this individual level impact um, and move, moving more upstream of this community um, level factors um, that overall can benefit our patients and families and working towards um, kidney equity for all. And with that, I'd like to thank a really incredible research team, including Jody Smith, um, my research mentor, and Miranda Brafford, who assisted with our stats, um, in addition to their support of the KRI and the T32. And with that, I think I left a couple minutes for questions um, prior to pass. So thanks um, so much for listening, um, and feel free to ask away. Thank you so much, Chloe, for this, for this talk and this really um, important work. Uh, questions for Chloe. Suzanne. So this was great. Um, a couple of comments and maybe one question at the end. I'll try to be quick. Um, first of all, you talked a lot about the data that you used with SRTR. There's good um, literature in the adult transplant population that there are discrepancies between the various databases in terms of even things like mortality. So looking at SRTR versus the UNOS database and trying to match with USRDS. So that's just something that might be interesting if you're looking to do literature reviews um, for the pediatric population. Um, and the other thing is that with the modernization initiative that's currently um, happening after some um, legislation that was passed last summer, um, both by the House and the Senate, there was just appropriations that were increased by 23 million with the 2024 budget being passed at the end of March. So that's great. Um, but I'm more aware of what's going on in the adult um, area for modernization. Um, I think the HOLD Act and the other acts that you're talking about in terms of living donors are going to be really critical in terms of health equity in all the populations. Are you, um, is this just as relevant for the pediatric transplant population, more relevant, um, or is there not a lot of discussion about the modernization initiative nationally, if you know? Yeah, um, overall, there is a lot of discussion. I think we share similar goals, um, both in the pediatric and adult. Actually, there's a lot of overlap with that. And with regards to legislation, our um, ASPN um, Public Policy Committee has really been focused on living donor. And so a lot of um, the bills I include on this is part of our legislative agenda. So it's really great to have um, both pediatric and adult stakeholders focusing on that. And I do appreciate your question about the different databases because I, I agree there's a lot of differences in um, findings across them. And we are working on doing a NAPRTIX, which is um, a consortium across some pediatric um, institutions of more granular. Um, there's actually patient addresses available and using FIS data too to overall um, see how those findings compared to this study um, and you, linking to USRDS, all that stuff is in the work. So great ideas. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions for Chloe? Uh, yeah, you, Harn. Hey, Chloe. It's awesome talk. Um, uh, my question pertains to, you know, your table one where you showed the low, moderate, and high deprivation area. And it's very, one thing that's very striking to me was the fact that the high deprivation area has so much fewer um, recipients. So it's hard for me to imagine that there's less patients in high deprivation area who has less CKD less ESKD. So where do you think the fall off is? You know, every time I talk to the pediatric uh, nephrologist, you know, you guys are so enthusiastic. Everyone gets a transplant. No one gets left behind. So where do you think this drop off is? Yeah, I think that is really interesting. I, I was, we talked a lot about this. I don't know if I have a perfect answer for you. I think one of the interesting things about us compared to the adult population is that we don't have diabetic neuropathy, I guess. We don't have some of these um, um, outcomes related to overall diabetes, smoking, hypertension, et cetera. 50% of our population is from CACA. And so, and some of those things do overlie with areas of high socioeconomic deprivation, some of those health behaviors. So I wonder if that is some of the difference. Um, I don't know if I have a great answer for you, truthfully, you <laughs> are, um, of why. Um, and I think it just argues for more granular um, studies um, regarding this. The similar thing was seen in the liver po liver population to that pediatric liver population. And he didn't really have a great explanation either, but I think it just argues for more um, address-based, also qualitative research to um, granular studies regarding this. Yeah. 
Well, thank you again. Plenty more work for you to do in the years to come. Um, I uh, will switch gears.